Hello, this week we're going to take a look at some historical context and a little bit of content in the Book of Mormon from 3 Nephi chapter 1 through chapter 7. And there's a lot in here, so let's get going on this. I want to start with a quote by President Benson when he was the president of the church a few years ago when I was in high school. He said, quote, In the Book of Mormon, we find a pattern for preparing for the second coming. A major portion of the book centers on the few decades just prior to Christ's coming to America. By careful study of that time period, we can determine why some were destroyed in the terrible judgments that preceded his coming, and what brought others to stand at the temple in the land of Bountiful, and thrust their hands into the wounds of his hands and feet. So really this week, I think as you study the content in here, stand back for a moment and say, why are some going to be able to, just in a few short years, be with the Savior, and others are going to be destroyed? So let's take a look and just review a few things in here that may prove helpful for us. Now, in chapter 1, we'll start with verse 2. We see that Nephi uh, hands over all of the records to his son, Nephi. So on your screen here, we see that, remember, Alma the Younger. We have Alma the Elder who repented from Limhi's people. But we had Alma the Younger was the religious leader and the first chief judge. So you'll see on the chief judge side, you have the Alma. That's Alma the Younger. And remember King Mosiah, when he turned over the kingdom, he wanted to have a system of judges. So that's what we're dealing with. And remember, everything from this point, they instead of saying 600 years since uh, or before the birth of Christ, they didn't know that date. So they labeled everything at this point from the time that Lehi entered or left Jerusalem. And then at this time, they started to redo their timing based upon the first year of the reign of the judges. So religious leaders, we know that it was Alma and then Helaman and so forth, all the way down to Nephi. When we're here in 3 Nephi, we're talking about Nephi, who's the son of Nephi. So kind of Nephi the second. Now, if you look at the chief judges, you know, there's a list of chief judges we've uh, talked about, read about in the last couple of weeks. But then they had several horrible ones that have been really wicked. And so we're removing them and getting rid of them. So where are we at? Well, we know that we have a religious leader named Nephi, and we know that we're going to have a chief judge and governor over all the land, Laconius. So let's do a little bit more reading between now and then, and let's find some of these out. Verse 6, this is chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, again, verse 2 tells us that Nephi has control of the records, the brass plates and so forth. But verse 6 tells us that there is not only evil in the land, but those who are choosing evil are rejoicing over those who are choosing to be faithful. In other words, it's not just enough that, oh, it's nice you believe in your church. I'll believe in what I want to believe. It's now where the unbelievers are persecuting those that have faith and belief. And the remember the prophecies of Samuel the Lamanite and other prophecies that the sign will be given that there will be a star in heaven. So these unbelievers, instead of just saying, it looks like they weren't quite right, they're persecuting the faithful. And I think that is one of the things that we're going to see in this day. If you believe in the doctrines and principles of Jesus Christ, in marriage uh, that's between man and a woman, if you believe in the traditional family, if you believe in Jesus Christ and prophets and apostles, uh, it's not just that others won't believe you, but I think you're going to see a level of persecution uh, because that's a type of what was taking place here. So in verse 9, these unbelievers are setting an, an artificial date. They're choosing based upon what they think the timeline is from when these prophecies were supposed to be given, the date that they're going to go ahead and kill all of the righteous people. Again, it's not enough to say we just don't believe in you. It's you believe in something different than we believe, so we're going to kill you because you're wrong. 
that's how evil this group is. And again, you could argue, maybe you see that today, people who believe a certain way, it's not just enough that you disagree with them, but they want you to believe and act in their way. So if you go to verse 12, and it came to pass that he, this is Nephi, cried mightily unto the Lord all that day, and behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, in verse 13, on this night. I do find it's interesting that it's on the night that the unbelievers artificially chose by their calculations that we're going to kill everybody, that the Savior waits to the last moment, and or he allows them to go up to that moment. And then obviously the sign comes and the star rises in the heaven and it's beautiful. And it's Nephi who's doing all this. He's great. The very last verse in chapter 1 is also insightful. It's verse 30. Verse 30 says, And thus were the Lamanites afflicted also, and began to decrease as to their faith and righteousness. And then here's the why. Because of the wickedness of the rising generation. A powerful generation choosing wickedness, and it's causing all groups to decrease in faith and righteousness. Now, let's go to chapter 2. Now, chapter 2 says it has been five years since the sign was given. Again, now they're recording time based upon the sign, the star, that sign, which we know is uh, the day that the Savior was born, in this case here. So, it's interesting. In five years, it says the people began to forget those signs. Even though there were lots of signs, and everybody knew, even the wicked, like, uh, okay, I guess we can't kill them because there is the sign. And they do repent, And uh, but five years go by. How do we forget after just five years? And I've seen people who on their wedding day promise uh, to hold and to love and to cherish, and they've made covenants with each other, and less than five years, they don't even like each other anymore. How how can we turn our hearts so quickly? Uh, people on uh, make a baptismal covenant. I'm going to be staying true and faithful. I'm going to keep my covenants and promises. And with a very short amount of time, they're not keeping any of those covenants. And they've left the safety and the, the blessings of the church. Uh, some people... Uh, set a goal or a New Year's resolution. I'm going to eat healthy. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to be fit. And not even a week goes by and they're back to some of their old habits. It's it's the natural man within us. We forget so quickly. That's why uh, when we discussed Helaman 5, how many times the word remember was in there. Even in our sacrament prayers, the, the word remember is in there. So maybe think about that and ponder that as you're studying this week. Uh, what are some ways that we can remember? I, I was thinking uh, we we have memorials. We sometimes place monuments, statues, things to help us remember. Uh, unfortunately, those that don't want to remember want to tear those things down. They No, we do not want to remember this. Destroy it and, and, and get rid of it. Um, maybe there's some things that you uh, can do to remember, whether it's make your own memorial or create your own holiday. Uh, I, I hope we don't lose Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter as holidays where we remember specific events and things. I just think they help us to remember. I think there's a reason we have those. Let's keep going on here. Uh, verse 5 says, it's been a hundred days since Mosiah. So if I go back up here on this previous chart here, remember, Mosiah was up here before the chief judges. So we're now a hundred years later, and Mosiah's gone, and now we're in some severe crisis as a country. Oh, verse 8 tells us that the time will now be reckoned from this time. Uh, verse 12, the Lamanites, many of them are being converted, but they're taking up arms against these Gadianton robbers. Uh, there's just wickedness. Let's just go straight to chapter uh, chapter 3 now. Chapter 3 tells us about some people here. Verse 1, we know that Laconius is the chief judge and governor. 
We're 16 years since the sign. So time has flown by here. He receives this letter, this epistle from the robber, the Gideon robber, the chief Gideon robbers, Gideon High. And I have that written down on the screen for us so you can remember that name and, and highlight that and mark that. Gideon High is going to really give him a choice. You will join our evil group and we'll tell you our secrets. Or you're going to cry unto the Lord for your own strength. And I like that in verse 12. In fact, let's go to verse 12 because that is a great verse. And the name is of Gideon High is in verse 9. Verse 11, he's astonished by the boldness. I think that's interesting. But verse 12. Uh, Laconius, the governor, was a just man and could not be frightened by the demands of a threatening of a robber. Therefore, he did not hearken to the epistles of Gideon High. In other words, he's like, I know it might be popular and I know we have political demands, but he is going to stand true for what's right. The end of the verse there, notice where it says, but he did cause that his people should cry unto the Lord for strength against the time that the robber should come down against them. Verse 13, yea, he sent a proclamation among all those people that they should gather together. Again, at a time when people are being scattered, a righteous leader will gather his people to provide strength, support, and encouragement. So now you have a choice. Are you going to gather at the hands of the angry Gideon and robber? You're going to scatter on your own, or you're going to gather with the righteousness. Those are kind of our three choices. And we'll see where each of them will take us as you read and study this. So these people choose to gather, which is great. Verse 13, gather for strength, for great strength. Verse 16 helps us learn a little bit about, uh, about, this, uh, about Laconius. He was also considered a prophet because he was so great and marvelous, uh, a great man. I wish we had uh, great leaders like that uh, politically throughout our great country in this world. Verse 18, we learn a little bit about the chief of all the chief captains. His name is Gidgadoni, and I put him there on the screen for you to see too. He's the military leader, and he was a righteous man. So now you have Laconius and Gidgadoni and Nephi. All three are, are around each other trying to combat all of the turmoil, strife, and horrible things that the Gadiatin robbers are there. So if you will see that they fight, and you can study this, they gather to defend, you can have some great discussions. Remember in verse 24, this is chapter 3, verse 24, they can't go up north because the land has such a curse upon it, so, th so they have to gather down south, which they do. Let's go over to chapter 4. Chapter 4, we know we're 18 years since the sign. So it's about 18 AD. They're going to gather in one location in verse 7, or excuse me, in verse 4. And they think they have seven years worth of supplies to hold out against these robbers. And there's battle and so forth. Verse 14, we learn that Gideon High, the Gideon robber, is, is killed in battle. He gets replaced in verse 17 by Zarahemna. I put that up here for you. Zera, Z excuse me, Zemnariah. Zemnariah is the new leader. And he gets found wounded in the battle, and they actually uh, hang him from a tree to symbolize we're not going to let evil come into our society. And that's verse 28. So there's several things in there. So we also find out that Laconius uh, gives the new leader to his son who is also named Laconius. So let's see where we're at now. Let's go to chapter, chapter 5. Chapter 5, we'll just look at a couple of quick things here. Verse 1 tells us that nobody doubted that the prophets are true. Nobody. Because everything that they said had become fulfilled. Now, we're not there yet. But I want you to think, do you have enough faith to believe that everything that our prophets and apostles and the great men and women who lead this church, that their prophecies will all be fulfilled? Or are you still in the boat where you're like, no, yeah, those guys are wrong. They've made mistakes. They're human and they've made mistakes. I wish I could help correct their, their human follies. Uh, you know, which camp are we in? Uh, here we find out that eventually 
these people, and I think this is a type of what's going to happen. Everybody will say, wow, I can't believe that President Benson or President Hinckley or President Nelson, everything that they said uh, came true. Uh, the prophecies, the proclamations, everything, all true. So what do they do when they find this out? In verse 3, they start to forsake their sins. They start to repent, make some changes in their life. Verse 12 is a little content that is helpful with our context. Uh, we know who's writing this. At least the main record keeper is Mormon. And he tells us where he gets his name from. In case there's any doubt that when Alma the Elder was baptizing in the lands of Mormon, in the waters of Mormon, in that beautiful country side there, that... That's where Mormon gets his name from, from his father. And he tells us that in 3 Nephi chapter 5, verse 12. You may want to mark that. That's just a fun little, con, little historical context thrown in there. Let's go to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1. We're now 26 years after the sign. So 26 years have passed away. People have believed and then not believed, believed and not believed. They've gone back and forth, just this cycle of humility and destruction. So the Lord blesses us because we're humble, and then the pride creeps in. And we see that again here. Uh, everyone returned home. And what do they do when they return home? They prosper with gold and silver. It's, it's a wonderful time. But... Uh, verse 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, that whole section in there. Uh, 29 years have passed away and pride creeps in. So we're talking three years because in 26 AD, they return home and they prosper. The Lord blesses them because of their faithfulness. We're now at 29 AD. Three years later, pride is creeping in. Uh, verse 17, we know that it's now another year. It's wicked. Um, verse 19, that's where the second Laconius gets put in there. Uh, so that's chapter 6, verse 19. And then here in this chapter, the end of verse 6, they want to gather these wicked uh, judges, the people who had the prophets kill. Hey, everyone who was going to kill the prophets and stone and kill the righteous people, we need to put them on trial. And in the end of chapter 6, we find out that this group becomes so large and they buy their way throughout society that they decide we're going to overthrow our leader Laconius and we're going to create a king so let's go to chapter 7 and see what happens in chapter 7 and this is our last chapter for this week chapter 7 uh the verse 1 the chief judge is murdered that's 30 years after the sign has been given so after 30 years of everyone knowing that okay the prophets are true to up and down, up and down, up and down. We're now 30 years later. We're now knowing that if you're uh, righteous, we're going to kill you. We're going to come get you. And they kill the chief judge. Verse 2. The pe I'll read this one. Verse 2. And the people were divided one against another. There was a division in society. And they did separate one from another into tribes. Every man according to his family. And his kingdom and friends. And thus they did destroy the government of the land. Again, now, if the Book of Mormon is a type of what's going to happen before the Savior, just think, are we united as a group now, or is there a stark division in society? Are we gathering, or are we separating into our own groups of family and friends? Think about where we're at and, and where we might be in this case, because that goes up and down many times before the Savior comes. So, verse... Eight is a good summary here for us. Chapter 7, verse 8. And thus six years have not passed away since the more part of the people had turned from their righteousness, like the dog to his vomit, or like the sow to her wallowing in the mire. Again, this is Mormon's commentary here. He's like, how can you go from righteous to wicked so fast? And what could be done to prevent this? No, again, we, we've already talked about you and I. There's things that we know that we're, we are never going to do that or we're always going to do this and it doesn't happen. What can we do to prevent that? How can we prevent this cycle of pride and destruction to cause us to be humble? There's a solution. Uh, President Benson said, be humble. Choose to be humble. 
Love that. So let's take a look. Chapter uh, 7 still. Verse 9, we're going to have a new leader. Verse 9, now this secret combination which had brought so great iniquity upon the people did gather themselves together and did place at their head a man who they did call Jacob. And they did call him their king. Therefore, he became a king over this wicked band. So we see now that the government here has combined where the chief judge and governor is now the king. He's a robber. They're all in this together. And Jacob is their man. So their whole point in verse 11, they came out. And it came to pass that they were not so strong a number as the tribes of the people who were united together, save it were their leaders did establish their laws, everyone according to his tribe. Nevertheless, they were enemies. Notwithstanding, they were a righteous people, yet they were united in the hatred of those who had entered into a covenant to destroy the government. Therefore, Jacob, seeing that their enemies were more numerous than they, he being the king of the band, therefore he commanded his people that they should take their flight into the northernmost part of the land and there build up unto themselves a kingdom until they, until they were joined by dissenters. And he flattered them that there would be many dissenters. And they became sufficiently strong to contend with the tribes of the people. And they did so. So again, I want to make sure you understand the story here. Because this will help you in your identifying of doctrines and principles and lessons to learn. Jacob leaves and forms his own group up north. And he slowly brings in all these dissenters until he feels sufficiently strong to, to combat them. Verse 14, and it came to pass in the 30 and first year, can we're only one year later, they were divided into tribes, every man according to his family, kindred, and, fr and friends. Nevertheless, they had come to an agreement that they would not go to war with one another, but they were not united as to their laws and their manner of government. So instead of having one beautiful large nation, we now are divided into these smaller little tribes. And what do they do? At the end of verse 14, their hearts were turned from the Lord their God. They did stone the prophets and did cast them out from among them. Now, verse 15, Nephi is back in the picture. And it came to pass that Nephi, having been visited by angels and also the voice of the Lord, having seen many angels, excuse me, having seen angels and being eyewitness and having power, had power given unto him that he might know concerning the ministry of Christ. So here we have Nephi who is going around and he's sharing this people. They see angel or he sees angels and he teaches them. And what's the result of the people? Verse 18. And it came to pass for they were angry with him. Even because he had greater power than they. Again, it's all about power. King Jacob wants to have power. Everyone goes into their own little tribe and family organization because they want to have power. Nephi comes out and his whole purpose is to tear down power and give it to the king of kings. The Lord of Lord, the host, the Lord of all hosts, uh, the Savior himself. And then we see in the end of chapter 7 all of the great and miraculous things that Nephi did, including uh, raise his brother from the dead. So if you'll notice here, the people are polarized completely. We have Jacob and his evil government and band of robbers. We have all of the little tribes. And then we have Nephi and the righteous who will follow him. So we have to evaluate where are we? Uh, who am I? Where am I? And am I going to follow the prophets that will lead me to the arms of the Savior? Now, I can be religious on my own but I do not have the authority to administer the ordinances of salvation on my own. That is held by only one man on this planet. And his name, you all know, is President Nelson currently. And we either follow the prophet or we are left to our own devices. Uh, yes, we can be spiritual. Yes, we can do great things, but we can't be led to the hands of the Savior. 
So my prayer and testimony as you continue to study, what do you see that you can do as a family, as an individual, with your friends to help people on both sides of the veil come to the Savior? Next week, we will chat, study chapters 8 through 11. We're going to see destruction and probably the greatest event ever to take place, at least on this American continent uh, when the Savior appears. And we'll see you next week.